The American Society of Magical Negroes is the worst movie I have ever seen. Yes, worse than Madame Web, The Marvels, and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania combined. The movie is so racist and so hateful that I felt disgusted with myself for watching it. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Sharks. White people. Oh. But this is kind of my job, so we forge on. I'll tell you what the movie is about with spoilers, so consider this your warning. I know, I know, you guys are really, really hoping to avoid spoilers for this masterpiece. The movie is about Aaron, a half-white, half-black man living in Los Angeles and struggling to get appreciation for his art, which happens to be made of yarn. Aaron is not what you would call the manliest of men, and one of the first scenes is of him struggling to get across a room of white people. Watching you walk through a room full of white people is the most painful painful thing I've ever seen. Now I know what you're gonna ask, reasonable viewer. What does Aaron's inability to navigate a crowded room have to do with white people? The answer, according to the movie, is simple. Every single one of Aaron's problems is white people's fault. Aaron doesn't know how to make room for himself because of racism. No one is buying Aaron's art because of racism. Aaron doesn't love himself and lacks confidence because of racism. Aaron is unhappy because of racism. Now watching what clips you have so far of this movie, you might also wonder baggage claim how come there's so many white people in this movie when it's based in LA in 2024 where it's Hispanics and not the whites that are the majority of the population? Well, it's because of racism. Do you get how this works? Aaron, after getting fired from the gallery that usually features his work because of racism, no, because his work isn't selling. It could be considered racist if he wasn't given the opportunity to feature his work, but if his work isn't resonating with people, or surprise, surprise, if it isn't good, then it won't sell, and consequently, he'll lose the shelf space at the gallery. That's called the free market. But nice try blaming all of your problems on white people. Anyway, Aaron is dejected because he's in financial trouble since he spent $3,000 on yarn for his next sculpture, and is pondering how to blame additional white people for his poor decisions when he comes across a drunk white girl who needs help. While trying to help her, her two male white friends think he's trying to rob her and try to start a fight because that is totally something that happens. I mean, it's in a movie. Why would a movie lie? Aaron, who looks like he has the upper body strength of a baby, not to mention the fashion sense of an out-of-work clown, gets rescued by Roger. Roger is part of the American Society of Magical Negroes and uses said magic to calm the angry white people by... <sighs> recommending a good barbecue spot around the corner. Yeah, guys, I know, I know. We're not even 10 minutes into this movie. I know you really want to quit watching this video right now. And Lord knows I wanted to walk out of the theater, but hang in there. We can get through this together. Roger then proceeds to recruit Aaron into the fold by explaining to him the world-saving work that the society engages in. White people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day. After hemming and hawing a bit, Aaron joins the society and is assigned Jason, his newest client, who he is now tasked with making comfortable. In order to do so, he has to give up his crush, Lizzie, because, you know, Jason likes her too. <sighs> Guys, I'm really sorry I have to subject you to this drivel. There is literally a scene that goes on for way too long where Aaron describes to Lizzie why yarn makes him feel happy. Yeah. During the climax of the movie, Yes, we're already at the climax because I think I had a rage blackout for much of the movie. During the climax, Aaron has this meltdown because he's sick and tired of pandering to his white client and giving up his own desires just to make him comfortable. He yells at Jason, yells at the world, yells at Lizzie in a romantic sort of way and decides to stop being such a pushover. Since he acts so selfishly, he destroys the magic that powers the society. He is thrown out of the organization, but not before successfully changing everyone's mind about whether being so accommodating to white people is actually good for black people. The movie ends with him walking with his great love Lizzie and having the most boring conversation I've ever heard. So there you have it, the synopsis of a very bad film. If you were wondering why a movie like this was made, Here's a hint from Kobe Libby, the writer and director of the film. I think we're pretty good at telling stories about overt racism, slavery stories, legal discrimination, because they're visual, but the more common microaggressions are incredibly hard to pin down. So the fact that you have it is proof that you deserve it? Kind of. One of the things I hope to do with this story is try to make that almost intangible, invisible quality of racism tangible and visible. You'll use a white tears meter. 
to let you know when their distress has returned to acceptable white person levels. So, did you catch that? Forget about the magical society. The real magic is in the concept of microaggressions. Did you see my skin color? Microaggression. Did you ignore my skin color? Microaggression. Did you hire a white person over me? Microaggression. Did you argue with me when I accused you of racism? Microaggression. Oh, the rules are eternally impossible to navigate, and that's the point. If you don't know the rules, then you can't win the game. And bless white people, because even though race baiters have convinced everyone that white people are the most dangerous and racist people in the world, it's the white people's willingness to be courteous and accommodating that makes all these games even possible. And let's give credit where credit is due. Despite slavery literally being a staple of every civilization that has ever existed, it was the white people in the UK where Quakers and other religious groups spoke out against the institution on moral grounds. In the 1700s, various anti-slavery societies were established in the UK, such as the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. William Wilberforce, yes, a white man, introduced bills in Parliament for the abolition of the slave trade multiple times until it was finally passed in 1807. It was the actions of these people and groups that began the worldwide recognition that slavery is wrong. Even many of the American founding fathers were staunch opponents of slavery and struggled to rid the institution because of the deep roots it had in the South. Thomas Jefferson, who inherited all of his slaves, tried many times to change the laws since at the time in his state, it was illegal to set slaves free. And as a young attorney, Jefferson represented several slaves for free in suits seeking their freedom. But his argument in cases like Howell versus Netherland, that under the law of nature, all men are born free, did not amuse Virginia judges. Jefferson lost every case. His greatest life's regret was that he was unsuccessful at changing these laws and was prevented from freeing his slaves, saying, the whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it. And with what execration? Should the statesmen be loaded, who permitting one half the citizens thus to trample on the rights of the other, transforms those into despots and these into enemies, destroys the morals of the one part and the love of one's country of the other? And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift of God? Today, we only hear half the truth about our founding fathers, so we can all be effectively convinced to hate our history and hate the great men that came before us and started the work of ending slavery. This country went to war with itself to end slavery, and many white men died for that cause, and many white people marched with Martin Luther King Jr. to end racism in this country. And in 2008, a predominantly white country elected a black man as the president, twice. The people who created this movie and continue to participate in race baiting want to spread their way of looking at the world. That is to say, through race-tinted glasses, because it gives them easy access to clout. Being seemingly oppressed is a surefire way to gain the sympathy of those around you. Have doors open for you that others might have to work to walk through. But most importantly, get the opportunity to dominate white people. Say it with me, Jimmy. Black, Black lives, lives matter. matter. Louder, Jimmy. Black, Black lives, lives matter. matter. Louder, Jimmy. Say it so that my kids can hear it. Black, Black lives, lives matter. matter. By forcing them into playing a game that they can never win. And it's about time we all stop playing along.